Let me introduce more Knight from one stage to another, um, from a pro dancer to a pro speaker, from traveling the globe, performing with number one selling artists um, and entertaining millions to working in five continents, 19 countries as an award-winning digital entrepreneur. Um, he's built a one and a half million dollar technology company in less than two years. He's now a top 100 global influencer <clears throat> who has connected with over 4 million people to date with a vision to help 100,000 companies go through a profound digital transformation by 2020 and the author of uh, Think Digital First. Here today to talk about how technology is changing the future of our work. Please give a massive warm welcome to the stage, Mr. Warren Knight. <laughs> Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. That was well written. Thank you. Yes. I, um, <laughs> Good morning, RTI. Good morning. Okay, come on. I know you guys are in finance. And having built a tech company, understanding finance is very, very important. But I had the pleasure of going out for dinner with Caroline and Kimberly last night. There was Kimberly. There's Kimberly. And we were talking about uh, RTI as an organization. And Kimberly, throughout the whole time of sitting there and having dinner with her, kept reiterating the importance of finance and how she felt that you guys are the heartbeat of RTI. So if you're the heartbeat of RTI, that means you've all got passion. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to try that again. <laughs> Good morning, RTI. Good morning. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to be with you for about the next hour. Um, we're going to be looking at everything from playing with some artificial intelligence. We're going to be going back to 1966, which I didn't even know about, actually, as far as um, NASA talking about you guys. I've got a little personal framework for you as well to play with. But more importantly, we're going to be looking at some of the emerging technologies. And again, I'm going to be reiterating and sharing with you guys again the importance of looking at this emerging technology that's coming out into the marketplace at the moment and its place within the future of work. But before we do that, having fun with the clicker. Okay, so what you're looking at on the screen here, I actually had the pleasure of meeting the gentleman that put this together, a guy called Nick Skyland, who is in NASA. Now, I had no idea that question was going to come up about you guys in 1966. So I thought, well, this is absolutely brilliant for you. And what he did, along with other people inside of NASA and other great experts, subject matter experts, decided to look at what does the future of work actually look like? And so he has put a process together, a framework, to help you get a much better understanding of what that looks like. Now, later on, where I'm going to get each and every one of you to play with some artificial intelligence. I'm going to take you directly off to go and read his article in a lot more detail, should you wish to take that action. But for today, we're going to be looking at these four core areas. The first one, focusing on the mission of the business and how important that is for the organization. Then we're looking at the people and why we need to keep um, developing and researching and learning about the individuals in our organization. Then we're looking at the place. So you guys have got a fantastic building here. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, walking around and going upstairs and looking at where you're currently working at the moment. And it fits really nicely into the future of work. And then the technology. So I'm going to be taking you through a bit of a journey today around what that looks like. And technology has been very much a part of my life for the last 12 years. Um, I used to work with Disney. I worked out of China for 11 years. I used to deal with all of your dollar stores over here, selling them different flashing products for many, many years, of which I still hold the record of doing a million dollars of sales in a single month with Disney. Um, so I still hold that record today. Um, and um, technology very much has been about me in the last 12 years. But I also use technology to, um, well, for, for personal reasons. And something that was brought up earlier, actually, was... Um, I was in my home, bored, unhappy, crying to myself, thinking, what, what have I got in life? And I decided to download an app. Yep, that was me. I found my wife on Tinder. <laughs> you have met anybody here? So who's met a partner on Tinder here at the moment? Oh, excellent. Just me and you. So I found my wife on Tinder. You're not my wife. That's why I didn't mean it. 
um, I found my wife on Tinder, and then going through that process of um, courting with my wife, um, very typical word, uh, English word, um, we actually realized that there was something missing in our lives. And for 18 years, I was always told it wasn't going to be possible. So my wife and I decided to go on a bit of a journey of um, going through some fertility treatment. And we did three rounds of fertility treatment, which was, uh, has anybody here done IVF with their children? So you'll know what I mean when I understand the pain that you go through of the highs and the lows. And so fortunately, in our third round, we got our very first daughter. And um, funnily enough, her name is Dixie. Um, it's a very American name. And uh, so she just turned two. But then um, nature would have it that uh, we decided to have another little one as well that came completely naturally. So that's Dixie, she's just over two, and then Blossom was born five months ago, completely naturally. So all what we went through with the uh, fertility treatment, we actually did buy one, get one free, which was <laughs> absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so I decided to move out of London after being there for 25 years, and in doing so, um, and I understand that you guys as well now have an apiary on land, so I'm now a beekeeper. Um, so I now have 50,000 bees, and I love educating um, uh, neighbors' children around the whole beekeeping process. And to just put this into a little bit of context for you, uh, I've been doing it for 12 years. I've built a methodology called Think Digital First. Uh, I wrote a book uh, six years ago now called Think Digital First, and then rewrote it three years ago. I'm actually going through the process right now of writing a brand new book, which is all about digital leadership and the future of work. And I've actually spent the last six to eight months uh, interviewing some incredible individuals that are running organizations similar to your side. Individuals that are turning over multi-million dollars online with completely virtual staff. And trying to understand what are those common denominators between each one of those individuals. Now, if you would like a copy of my book and don't tell custom, I've got some of my lovely honey here which has been produced by, by, by my bees. Now, um, is there anybody here that would like a copy of my book and some of my honey? Would you like to win? Okay, very good. So there's probably about 50% of you in the room. Excellent. Now, going on the theme of what we've spoken about earlier today, and I really hope somebody's going to win the book and the honey, um, I have a question for you. And the person who answers this question will win the book and the honey. So, it came up on the screen earlier. Does anybody here know what your new vision statement is? I know your mission statement is still the same, but you've had a few tweaks around your mission statement. So who here knows your mission statement and would like to win a copy of the book, but more importantly, the honey? Who here knows your vision statement? Would anybody like to have a stab at the vision statement? <laughs> I was worried this was going to happen early in my with your response. Anybody want to have a stab at it? Okay, yes. Sorry, what's your name? Eve. Okay, go on, Eve. <laughs> I'm staying silent just to put you in a little bit more pain as you went through that process. So um, here is your vision, uh, your vision statement. And you're pretty much spot on, uh, Eve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump down here. Oh, we, we, come on, bring it in. We'll it home. <laughs> so there you go. There's a, a copy of the book. The honey is far more important. So, yeah. So we address the world's most critical problems through science-based solutions in pursuit of a better future. Okay, so let's crack on and look at the future of work. Now, if we're going to go through the process of understanding what the future of work looks like, we, as an organization, really need to understand what our goals are. So going through the process of working with companies like you, startup businesses, tech companies, and speaking to people, the commonality came around three core areas of understanding what the future of work looks like for a business and their goals. The first one being customer transformation. So in other words, blending the physical with the digital. We need to blend the two of them together to truly understand what this means to our future. The second one is all about information transformation. Now, you quite kindly brought up a couple of um, uh, statements around what digital transformation means. Um, from my perspective, 
with what we do within our organization, embracing technology means that we're going through a digital change. And I'm going to highlight this to you in a minute. When it comes to look at that data monetization for digital transformation, that's when we reach that sort of tipping point of 50% of our revenue coming in through technology. That, from my perspective, is true digital transformation. And as you've heard, and I will repeat it a few times today, I'm sure you hear it over and over again, we're not in a marathon with this. We're, sorry, we are in a marathon with this. We're not in a sprint with this. It's going to take time for us to get to that process. But it's important that we have it as a goal. And the third one is all about the digital business space. So how can we personalize everything that we're doing? I've got some case studies that I'm going to be sharing with you how things can be personalized by technology. So I'm going to bring you back to what we talked about earlier, and I'm going to deep dive into each one of these themes for you. I do apologize now. It's a little bit text heavy, but it pretty much is the only way that I could get it across to you. So if we look at the mission, and I've highlighted some of the most important things. And again, words that have already been mentioned this morning, both by Mike and Hannah and, and Lucas, around being fast, being able to adapt quickly, facilitate, learning, embrace, dynamic needs, increasingly diverse workforce. This is the focus on the impact for the people. Theme number two, redefining talent. So we look at redefining talent, runs along continuing range of traditional full-time and part-time workers, supplemented by machine talent. So bringing the two together. Then we look at uh, what we've got going on here around the uh, people. So learning and development, talking about the lifetime. So providing learning and development for its workforce to ensure continued relevance and competency. Relevance is a really key word here when it comes to the learning. Then we've got uh, deploying talent mobilization. So offering experiences that inspire and challenge them throughout their career. Now, I heard earlier that you've got somebody that's been here for 33 years. You've got other people that have been here for a much shorter period of time. So we really need to understand how we can offer that experience to those different people that have come through at different stages within the organization. Uh, we're looking at the third part here. So place, embracing a modern workspace. You know, I heard that it's taken two years to get this building for you guys to be able to have that collaborative open workspace upstairs where everybody can connect and communicate with each other, even though you might be in different departments. So flexibility, autonomy, collaboration. Again, another word that I've heard quite a few times today. Agile workforce, another word that I've heard today. Um, designing and sharing security reasons. So we have to truly understand that an enterprise data management strategy and a, mon a modern common data architecture is critical to the security sharing of information and data. So this is what NASA have actually put together and sharing with all of you. And then we look at the last part, which is the technology. So prioritizing digital transformation. The whole reason why you are here today is about prioritizing that digital transformation. Digital transformation that leads to more information decisions and operational efficiencies. And then looking at unleashing. So what Marcus and Hannah are doing, they are unleashing that opportunity around analytics, around automation, around AI. There isn't a perfect solution to make this happen. We have to test, try. Now, depending on how your organization works, um, within my technology business, we went through a design thinking process. So what does that technology look like? We then in, went into a lean start process where we built our minimum viable product, which is what you heard um, Hannah and Lucas talk about, and then going into a more agile approach of actually understanding what it is that we're doing and then launching that out into the marketplace. And I think that, that they're saying earlier was um, think big, build small. And this is what we're talking about here when it comes to the future of work. So I have some questions for you. You've all been listening this morning. You've all heard whispers around what's going on and what's going to be happening today. I want you now to challenge yourself. I've got some questions that I'd like you to reflect on. So please grab your mobile phones, um, take out your phones, however you like to write things down, whether it's on a piece of paper, whatever that might be. Grab your mobile phones, and I want you to spend the next couple of minutes 
answering these questions. What I've shared with you around the future of work from uh, NASA, what you've been hearing from Mike this morning and the importance of going through a digital transformation, how we're taking that information, as Hannah and Lucas have said, and actually thinking about building something small with the future in mind. So these are questions, these are reflection questions I'd like to ask you, yourself. The first one, what do you see the challenge being in your organization? So this is purely focused on the future of work. Where do you see that challenge being in your current organization? And just write it down. Could be a couple of words, could be a sentence, whatever that might be. The second one, what opportunity will this bring if delivered and embraced? What opportunity will it bring if it's delivered and embraced as an organization? Number three, are you ready to focus on making a difference? We understand what the mission for the organization is. We know what the vision, well, some of us know what the vision is for the business. <laughs> this is about you individually. Are you ready to focus on making a difference? Question number four, which one area can you focus on to get a quick win? If you're going to embrace the future of work, where do you feel personally where you could actually embrace it, focus on it to get that quick win? And then number five, which one area do you see being the most challenging? Now, the beautiful thing about these self-reflecting questions is that each and every one of you could potentially have a different answer. But understanding that, and this is the reason why I want you to write it down, we think about a lot of things in our life. When we actually put them down on paper, okay, it's there in black and white or on my computer screen or whatever that might be. And if we've got that thing that written down and it's a goal that we want to achieve, so what's the one thing that you can focus on to quit, get a quick win? Then you will take that and put that into action. So I'll give you another 30 seconds just to finish this off. Where's the challenge? What's the opportunity? Where's the focus? What can you do today? Or where do you see that biggest challenge being? And maybe how you can help move that forward. Now, these five questions are really, really important because I'm going to bring it right back at the very end to you as an individual within the organization. So I mentioned about change and transformation earlier, and I wanted to break it down for you in quite a simple way. When we think about going through, think about digital and that word transformation, I think we need to um, align ourselves to what the reality of what that means. Digital change means that we're getting a better version of the past, which is very much about what this building is all about. However, as far as what we saw with the virtual reality earlier, and uh, the type of wins that we're going for, there are smaller, more agile companies coming into your marketplace and nibbling at your heels. So whilst you're going through a change, you are still vulnerable to that disruption. However, when you go through a transformation, this is all about building a brand new business model. Uh, I had the pleasure of being over in Amman a couple of weeks ago. And I was working with one of the biggest petroleum companies over there, employ 8,000 people. They've got one customer, which is the Oman government. But inside of that organization, they've built some incredible processes. They've got some technology that delivers those processes in, internally. So what we did through a three-day process was extract all of that information out and build a brand new business with a brand new business model, creating new values that, is, that goes into the oil marketplace and completely disrupts it. Now, I know, Mike, you mentioned earlier about some other opportunities around revenue streams. That's where transformation really happens. So this isn't about being a caterpillar, caterpillar that just changes its color. We want to transform into a butterfly. Every single thing about this butterfly is completely different to the caterpillar. Caterpillar. Um, can't your words up. Understanding that we've got a new business model, we've got new values for our business, but we're creating that disruption within our marketplace. You, as an organization that of over 60 years, have this opportunity to create that disruption, but that has to happen internally. To do that, 
we've got to embrace the concept of digital leadership, as in who we are as individuals and how we can embrace that technology and become a leader within our team, within the organization, within who I am, whatever, whatever that might be. There are three core things that I need you to be thinking about to become a true digital leader. The first one, value proposition. Now, the organizations already share with you the new vision that we have for this. So we've got this great new rethink of our value proposition. Then we've got to think about remapping our community. So where is the current opportunity to bring revenue into the organization? That's one thing we need to think about. But more importantly, if we're going to go through a transformation, a true digital transformation, where's that new revenue stream coming from? So then we have to step outside of our traditional way of thinking and look at remapping our community. And the last but not least is about remastering our products and services. So as I mentioned, the Amani Petroleum Company, they're taking that and remastering the current products that they have that they built internally and turning that into a new revenue stream for their business. You have this opportunity. There are ways that you are currently working within the organization that make it unique, that give it this intellectual property. Um, we went for dinner at uh, Ruth's. Uh, steakhouse last night, and the waitress uh, very kindly told us about the patented oven that they have there. And I was like, oh, it's a patented oven. Yep, Ruth designed a specific oven that enabled to lock in the juices of the steaks um, without cooking it all the way through. I see Kimberly smiling there. So I want you to be thinking about how can we do something a little bit different and build our, our, our own intellectual property, and thinking that every single one of those touch points is throughout that user journey. Now, I'm going to touch on some of the emerging technologies. Um, some we've spoken about today, some we haven't. I'm going to um, highlight to you some of the ways that we could be using this uh, emerging technology. And also, based on what I had last night um, more with Caroline, I actually did some more research and I changed my presentation based on what was discussed last night to try and help everybody understand how this emerging technology is embracing organizations and how we can bring it in and build what we call in the tech world a minimum viable product, which is what Hannah and Lucas are doing. So when we look at um, IoT, Internet of Things, um, I've got a very, very, very simple framework for you. Really, it's all focusing on you know, any product, uh, sorry, any device um, connected at any time with anybody to any service or business on any network, in any place, any time. Now, um, how many people here have got an Alexa at home or they've got a Google? So you've got, okay, gosh. So the, the statistics, as far as what I've heard, about 50% of North America are using uh, voice activation as a way of communicating various different outcomes. So there was nearly 40 to 50% of the people here saying they've got an Alexa at home. And this is all about the Internet of Things, getting connected wherever. I could pick up my device now and I could call into my wife at home. I can do that from being here. Now, um, here's a bit of a framework for you. Uh, I think, Mike, are you looking at Microsoft Azure as, as a potential sort of um, a, uh, a platform to use? So this is how Microsoft Azure are looking at the industry of Internet of Things, so the I.O. IIoT, Industry Internet of Things. And they're building it as a bit of a framework, as you can see here. So if we look at the bottom here, um, uh, intelligent devices, so looking at vehicle tracking, kiosks, healthcare, smart buildings, uh, smart homes. The next layer up, what does that really mean um, from that perspective? So it means we can track devices, we've got cameras, we've got smoke alarms, we've got um, uh, individual occupants, uh, sensors, temperature sensors, and this takes us through all the way through this Microsoft as a, um, uh, a platform here, all the way through to the top to help you get a much better understanding of where is IOOT, I -I um, currently being used at the moment. So smart cities, smart homes, energy, security and surveillance, healthcare, retail. All of these industries are currently using this technology. And so as an organization, we're embracing this at the moment. Data. 
of companies in, I mean, 29% of companies in North America are actually using data in a smart way. So that was a piece of research that was done by McKinsey. Only 29%. So whilst for many years we've been hearing this big data um, a term that's used quite a lot, at the reality is, not a lot of companies are really embracing this data and using it in a smart way. So if we take a look at what uh, something, I think it was, uh, Hannah, were you talking about, uh, you've got some data scientists. We've got data scientists coming in and they're going to be working with you guys, subject matter experts, to be able to achieve an outcome. Now, when we look at that data, this is a process that a data scientist has to go through to get to an end result. So when we talk about it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, I wanted to visualize to you all of the different stages. So um, once we know kind of what data we want to get, so when we look at our three Bs, velocity, volume, and variety, there are five Bs when it comes to data, but simply put, it's three Bs. Um, we go through a process of here, first of all, understanding what the business needs are. At the second stage here, we start taking that data and mining it. Once we've got that data and we've mined it, we need to clean it to what's important to our future. Step number five, we need to look at what the future and the features are for engineering and making that happen. Step number six, predictive modeling. So using machine learning to achieve an outcome with the cleaned data. Step number seven, data visualization. So you've already seen it today, how VR can help you get a much better understanding of that cleaned data with an outcome of wanting, might want an answer to a question. It's been visualized for you because we have all the data that's needed there. So I just wanted to share with you the process that a data scientist has to go through and the time that it takes to be able to achieve that outcome. Blockchain. Um, uh, so how many people here have heard of blockchain? Okay, good. How many people here understand blockchain? <laughs> very, very few people. Okay, so um, blockchain was actually uh, designed by a Japanese guy back in 19, 1996, and it was purely based on currency, so cryptocurrency. A lot of people confuse blockchain with cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrency sits on top of blockchain. Blockchain is the technology, and cryptocurrencies was the first use of uh, uh, blockchain technology. So what we're doing in today's um, uh, organizations of understanding how to use blockchain is really kind of been defined by Gartner have put a hypercycle together. If you haven't seen uh, the actual, uh, what Gartner do with all these different hypercycles, they can drill it right down into artificial intelligence, into blockchain. But I wanted to highlight this um, where we're at the moment with, um, with blockchain based on what Gartner are talking about. So as you can see here, we've got this up curve here. So this is all the noise that's happening in the marketplace at the moment. And I highlight a couple of these for you, healthcare and blockchain and education in blockchain. We're still at this process here of truly understanding it. Now, when we get to the curve at the top, then it starts coming down a little bit. And so now, as far as banking and investment services are concerned, we're starting to truly understand what this looks like for an organization. So I've got a bit of a process here for you. And as I mentioned, based on my uh, conversation that I had with um, Caroline and Kimberly yesterday, um, I'm going to visualize something for you to get a much better understanding. So this framework here is all about whether or not you, as an organization, should be using blockchain. And so I'm going to take the concept of what you guys have to do is you have to do surveys, right? You have to do a lot of surveys. So if we take the idea of actually uh, running a survey on a survey on blockchain, um, we're going to go through this yes-no process. So at the very top here, um, if we're going to run a survey, do we need a database? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Um, does it require shared uh, written access? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, are writers known and trusted within your organization? Yes, of course they are. Uh, do you need or uh, do you need or trust, uh, do you want or need to trust third party parties? Well, of course we do to achieve this outcome. Do you need to have control functionality? Yes, we do. Okay, great. And the last one here, do you want the transactions to be private or public? So at this point here, you can choose whether we're going to go for a public blockchain, whether we're going to do a hybrid of that, or whether we're going for a private blockchain. So as far as actually the surveys that you do, we've now got a potential opportunity here where you could use blockchain technology to be able to gather that data and make sure that 
payments are being made. Now, the research that I did last night, this company called Al Alteros, um, the company that's also that's known within this area here is called SAS, right? We all know SAS. Or SAS have been trained by these guys to understand how blockchain can enhance their business. So custom blockchain training from essentials uh, to advanced. So if you're looking at understanding how blockchain could potentially work for your organization, this is a company that will show you what that looks like. So now you've got a better understanding around block, what blockchain could do for your organization. This particular company here called Brand Ledger will now allow you to go through that process of getting a survey done and getting people paid through blockchain technology within their platform. So it looks a little bit kind of like this when it happens. So uh, somebody would sign in, go, yep, okay, great. Um, I want to take the survey. They would then log in, and then within that process, they would then go through that survey. Now, it's pretty standard, this particular part, but it's built on blockchain technology so that when somebody finishes the survey, it's only at that point then does the payment be made. But more importantly, all of the data is being held in a secure, private place, and every single time somebody fills out a survey, that's another block which then connects to another block, which has got a hash code and a timestamp based on it, and allows you to build this chain of data and information whilst those users are getting paid. So just something for you to think about. And again, I only did this research um, late last night for you, but I wanted to highlight to you, because Caroline, you know, share with me what you go through with your survey. Virtual reality. Um, you've already seen kind of what it looks like, so i just kind of highlight it to you again. You know, allowing people to be inside the data, visualizing that data at any time for any reason, so that when Mike um, asks a question or when Kimberly asks a question, you can get that data quickly, succinctly, and easily. So this is the future but we are having to go through a process of truly understanding how to bring this into the organization. Again, something that was brought up a little bit earlier. It's so easy to think about confusing a job with a task, but please don't do this because without humans, artificial intelligence you know, will not exist within your organization. We have to tell the, um, what, tell the computers what they need to do. So don't confuse jobs with a task. So I've got a case study that I want to share with you right now. So a big organization, Johnson Johnson, uh, put a case study together around, around using an RPA um, for a process of the finance department. So I'm going to take you through the three stages. Then I'm going to share with you the three successes that they got out of this. Stage number one um, was all about uh, if an email comes in from an organization, so an intercompany uh, charge comes in, the robot opens the email, opens up the Excel spreadsheet template that's got all the information built into it, again, something that you as subject matter experts has designed, pass it over to the clients, client sends the email in, the robot grabs that data and looks at that data. They then, after go through compliance and everything, check that. So the bot now checks it, validates it, looks at the spreadsheet and either decides one of two things. One, the data's not correct, returns the email to the particular person, tells them what's wrong to make those changes for that email to come back in again. Or the robot says, yep, this is completely correct. And now the robot loads it into a PO system. The final stage here is once the request has been approved into the PO system, the bot then raises uh, an invoice from your ERP system, and then that whole process has been automated around what's going on. So what were the three main factors that came out of this for Johnson Johnson? Well, first of all, efficiency. It helped save time. Second of all, it helped with the workflow. So in other words, the way people are communicating with each other and the speed of which that happened. And then first of all, the resources. So it stopped human beings using their own resource and time to facilitate an outcome and allowed it to happen completely automatically. Now, as I said, you know, this is automated, a bit of machine learning built into this, 
But ultimately, unless we as human beings have given it the right data, the data is always going to be wrong. So it is about you and upskilling your knowledge around how this technology can help the organization in the future. AI. Uh, question for everybody here. Who thinks that artificial intelligence, so in other words, a person my size or Mike's size, um, uh, will be walking around us within our lifetime? Who, who feels that this will happen? Okay, so there's, there's a few people in the room. So uh, I had the pleasure of opening up the AI conference up in uh, Scandinavia a few months back, and I had the pleasure of meeting Sophia. Has anybody heard about Sophia? She's an android. You heard about Sophia? So she was given citizenship in Saudi Arabia, right? Only Saudi Arabia would do that. Um, so uh, I asked her a couple of questions, and uh, one of those questions was, you know, are we going to be seeing androids walking around us in our lifetime? And she said, no, we are not going to see this happen. Dr. Rodney Brooks also agrees with what she's saying. So to put it into context for you, by 2030, as in artificial intelligence, an, an actual uh, size of a mouse, the size of a mouse being completely autonomous without any touch points from a human being will only be visible by 2030, the size of a mouse. 18 years later, we're going to be at the size of a dog. So by 2048, a totally autonomous sized dog will be potentially walking around us. So in my lifetime, I'm not going to see a human being, autonomous human being, walking around as an android. Maybe in my kid's lifetime, that might happen, but it's not going to happen yet. So that's from an artificial intelligence perspective for human beings or androids. But more important, if we look at what the value of that is to a business, so far in 2018, there's been $1.2 trillion spent on artificial intelligence and subsets of AI. So we've already heard about natural language processing. We've got vision and research and everything. We're going to visualize this all for you. So when it comes to the true business value of where artificial intelligence sits and data, I've got a little graph that I want to share with you to highlight you exactly where um, machine learning and artificial intelligence is at the moment. So if we take a look at this, um, what we've got down here is where your organization's already got. So we've got data integration, we've got digital governance around what's going on. Now we're moving into a more descriptive phase here. So we've got um, reporting, bench marketing, bench marketing, gosh, benchmarking, and, um, and, 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 and alerts. As we go further up here, we're looking at more predictive and prescriptive data. This is where machine learning starts to kick in quite nicely. So this is where we can start doing some forecasting, risk analysis. Um, we're looking at rules-based data around what's going on. And then sitting right at the very top is all about deep learning. There are phases that we need to go through within our organization to achieve this holy grail which sits right at the very top where machines are talking to machines and achieving an outcome in a deep learning way. Uh, so this is a report that's put together by McKinsey and sharing with you exactly as far as uh, companies in America, how they're currently using artificial intelligence, or more importantly, subsets of artificial intelligence. And when we look at here, I've highlighted some of some key areas for you. So in research and development, 33% of American companies that were um, part of the research are using it from a vision perspective. So we can look at virtual reality and having some uh, uh, natural language processing built into that. Customer service, using virtual assistants. So chatbots. We're looking at operations and um, advanced robots. If you get a chance, I highly recommend you go and take a look at an organization in the UK called Ocado. They have built a completely robotic automated process for picking everything that somebody orders within their uh, shopping basket. They've been completely revolutionary with that. Uh, then we're looking at finance and risk management. So machine learning, 22% of organizations are actually using uh, AI and subsets of AI, natural language processing, to achieve an outcome. Um, there is a process here um, when we look at <coughs> machine learning and the steps that we need to take for that. <coughs> I think uh, my uh, jet lag's kicking in quite nicely. So the steps that we need to go through here. Um, I was asked to kind of to highlight this to you again just so that you understand um, how much time 
that it takes to achieve an end goal. So we start off here with step number one. Very much we were talking about um, the process of gathering data here, step number one. Various different sources gathering that data. Go through the process of cleaning it. Um, step three, modeling it. Step four, getting those insights and then visualizing. Again, very similar to what I shared with you earlier around how we can bring those experts in to help you, but then use you as subject matter experts to get the right answers out of the questions. So NLP, natural language processing. Um, for me, it's really broken down into four core areas. The first one being voice search. Um, many of you are already using um, Alexa, Google, Siri, whatever that might be. This is how we can learn over time things that we're asking, things that we're doing through voice to help us get to the answer to our questions much quicker. Uh, second, smart documents. So if we take a look at blockchain earlier, um, De Beers is one company that's really driving blockchain and artificial intelligence. And what they're doing is they're understanding where was that diamond first mined, what country, what location, by who, by where, whatever that might be, and building it on a blockchain technology. So that then, once that diamond's gone through the place of where it's been initially mined, then which company brings it in, who distributes it, what shop owner then sells it, and what person buys it. So then, at the end of that purchase of that particular diamond, that person gets a smart document, which has been built on blockchain technology, and then has had the artificial intelligence process put on layer on top of it to make sure that that person gets all the answers to the questions of exactly where that came from. It's being used in real estate at the moment, um, online learning. So if you get a certificate through online learning, you're potentially getting your certificate built on a blockchain technology. Uh, virtual assistants. So some great data for you. Organizations that have been using virtual assistants have decreased inbound calls by 75%. If you're looking at it from a retail perspective and having chatbots on websites, you can increase sales by anything up to 7 to 8%, and 70% of those sales are coming through these chatbots. So when people are asking a question, the technology knows it has been asked before and gets them to where they need to go to. And then recommendation engines. So who here uses Netflix? And who's Netflix here? Okay, great. Spotify, who's Spotify here? Both of these companies have built their businesses on the back of natural language processing. You watch a particular movie, it then recommends it to you. You listen to a certain type of music, Spotify have two billion playlists built into their uh, uh, software. So this technology is being used by you every single day. We just need to look at the best ways that we can bring it in from a business intelligence perspective. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have some fun, guys. So please, can you grab your mobile phones for me? Thank you very much. And what I'd like you to do now is, let me click a works. There we go. What I'd like you to do now, please, is I'd like you to go to this URL, thinkdigitalfirst.com forward slash chatbot. When you go to this URL, you're going to be having some fun with machine learning in real time with every single person in this room. When you go into this little bit of machine learning, it will take you on a journey of what's important to you. So if you would like to grab the Future of Work uh, uh, blog by Nick Scotland, you can click on the link and go over and read that. If you want to come and find out more about me and my bees, you can come and do that as well. If you would like to grab a copy of this presentation, no problem at all. The machine learning process will take you through that journey to be able to then go and grab a copy of this presentation. Now, every single one of you here might potentially go on a slightly different journey of how you get there. You might want to achieve a different outcome for what's important to you. You want to come and connect with me on LinkedIn or come on Twitter, whatever that might be. You can also do that as well through this process. And the reason why I want to highlight this to you today is that you decide where you want to go, and the technology gives you the answer to that question. So who here went through the process? OK, so what, where did you end up? On the bees. OK, very good. Excellent. Who else has finished the journey? Yep, where did you get to? OK, great. Yeah, so we're going to connect. 
Who else has just finished? Anybody else just finished? Just put your hand in the air. Okay, yes, the lady at the back in green. Where did you get to? The what, sorry, the presentation. Okay, great. So we've heard from three different people wanting three different outcomes, and yet each and every one of you got to where you need to get to by using this little piece of technology. So I just set it up to be able to give you what you need. So this is where I want you to be thinking about um, what can we do within our organization to give people the answers that they're looking for, but actually allow us to use the technology to achieve that outcome. Okay, so you can go and have some more fun with that. You can go back again and, and, and grab all that information. Um, so I've got a little framework for you guys today that I want to share with you. As I said, um, for about the last six to eight months, I've been uh, speaking to a lot of digital leaders and truly understanding what is it that sits at the core of helping them achieve their future of work and transformation growth within the business. And it's really been broken down into four core areas. The first one being innovation. So you've got a new company vision of what's going on. We're looking at potential new business models that are happening, and we're re remastering what that looks like within our organization. The second part is you guys, the people, the workplace, the learning culture. We really want to understand how we can build fire starters and build that engagement in regards to what we're doing. The third step is all about the transformation of the business, being more customer centric being disruptive in regards to what we're doing and having a digital process to achieve that outcome. And last but not least, the strategy. So the thought leadership behind all of that, embracing those emerging technologies and implementing them into our business. And then having very much one approach, which is called an omni-channel approach in regards to what we want to achieve. So be innovative, understand how we can educate our people, how the business can go through that transformation, and then we need the strategy to implement it into the workplace. So I just want to share this framework with you for something to think about in regards to um, where you want to be personally. Now, um, this is a digital transformation roadmap. Uh, this is something that I uh, talk about in my talks and trainings, and um, I asked Mike if he wouldn't mind filling this out for everybody today. So what you're looking at here is RTIs digital transformation roadmap for the last for the next three years so if we look at where we're at right now the current state um we've got that analytical layer that we're building in you've already heard about uh wind forwards you've heard about highlands uh, and how that's going to do what's going to do for your um rpa we've got a cloud-based uh, erp coming in um so this is what we're looking at for sort of 2019 as we evolve into 2020 then we look at the compliance of that building out a project We've got potential um, revenue prediction for uh, version two, building into advantage unit, and then a project proposal management system. And then going into year three, multiple RPAs, uh, win forward, another project, version three prediction, um, virtualytics, and other things that we want to focus on. So this is your current digital transformation roadmap of where Mike has his vision of where we, how he would like to take you within the organization at the moment. So, talking about you and understanding where you sit and which quadrant that you sit in, I want you to be looking at this and really thinking about who you are individually. So, at the very top here, we've got the culture. At the very bottom, we've got the delivery of what it is that we do. And then over on each side, we've got the tactics that we use and the strategy that we implement within our business. So looking at this, where do you fit into this? Are you more culture driven and really would like this perfect picture of what everything looks like? Are you more tactical but based on the delivery? So you're very much an action taker around what's happening. Or is it that it's more the strategy? Part that you love getting involved with, but very important to have that delivery side of it. So you've got the thought leadership around what's going on. Where do you personally sit within this? Now, this is something that I've evolving on. It's going to be very much in the book that comes out in 2020 based on all the research from all the different organizations that I've been speaking to. But this for me, from a digital leadership and the future work perspective, is where wherever you sit, and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. It's about owning it and understanding it.
content is the voice of your strategy. Very much from the very beginning when I came into the digital space 12 years ago. And the reason that I came into the digital space was because one person said one thing and it crashed a website. So they used his, he used his influence and that voice to achieve an outcome for what was going on. And it was that pivotal moment that got me into understanding digital. Now, today, we might want to humanize that. So based on humanizing the content and the voice of our strategy, I've got something that I'd like to put to the table to you guys today. Now, some of you have come up and asked me the question around um, my past, and Mike mentioned it earlier. I used to be a professional hip hop dancer many, many, many years ago, um, but I still used to be a professional hip hop dancer. Now, I would like to invite somebody up onto the stage today. Now that somebody will only come up onto the stage and I will only show that person how they can do the moonwalk on the stage here and finish up by doing the robot in front of all you guys if you scream and shout and bring the house down. So if you would like Mike to come up on stage here, if you would like Mike to come up on the stage here and in front of everybody, show you how he can do the moonwalk. Now, I, it will be a bit of a hack of the moonwalk to quickly show him how to do it. If you want to see him do the moonwalk and finish up by doing the robot for you guys, then what I need for you to do is scream and shout and clap your hands so that you, as he walks up on stage here, his face is bright red. So would you like him to come up on stage here and do the moonwalk? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, so think, think about it. <laughs> so if you want to grab your mobile phones, you want to take a little video of this and, 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 and humanize the way you talk to your customers and clients, we can do this. So what I'd like to do, please, if you could stand here for me facing the wall. Um, you're at the front because you're far more important than me. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a quick hack of how we can do the moonwalk. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is put your weight on the ball of your right foot. So just put your weight on the ball of your right foot. And then with your right foot, I want you to drag that right foot back and then lift your heel in the air as you go through that process. So weight and then lift. Then switch your weight to the ball of your left foot and then drag that back and lift that heel up in the air. So then you Rubber soles are not really good. Well, Rubber <laughs> soles are better. But, yeah. um, and then you switch to the right again and then you pull that back and lift your heel up in the air. What if I fall over? Without putting your arm in the air, but that's okay. <laughs> if it gives you balance, that's okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to do the moonwalk, we're going to turn around, and then we're going to do some body popping at the very end and finish with the robot. <laughs> is that okay? Sure. Everybody ready for this? Yeah. So your videos ready? Okay. okay. So, um, ball the right foot, yep. we'll go one, two, three, and then we'll go right, left, right, left, and stop, and then we'll do a little Don't go too right. fast. Okay. No, we won't do, don't worry. Okay. Everybody ready? Yeah. Okay. One, two, three, let's go. That's it, that's it. Heel in the air, heel in the air. Heel. Turn to the audience, cough and knock a bit, leave your arms in the air. Do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So content Ooh. really can be the voice of your strategy. We want to humanize what we've got going on. Fire starters. Now, I know already that there are a couple of fire starters in the room. Um, now, I used to, when I was doing my professional hip hop dancing, I used to dance for a band called Prodigy. Um, and unfortunately, the, the singer took his own life a couple of months ago. Uh, and I spent a lot of time with him in my youth. And one of their most famous songs is Firestarter. But when it comes to thinking about your organization and the individuals within that organization, are you a fire starter that's going to embrace everything that we've heard and we've spoken about today through to the vision of the business, what Mike was talking about, what Hannah and Lucas are talking about, and some of the things that I've shared with you today? Are you going to be that fire starter within the organization, within your team, within your industry, whatever that might be? Are you ready to start fires? Are you ready to make a change? Are you ready to embrace the future of work? So what I've got for you here is a bit of a, uh, 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 an analogy for you, um, an acronym for you. Ah, 
masses as of jet lag's definitely kicking in. Um, a bit of an acronym for you when it comes to people. The first thing that I want you to do is think about you and your positioning. Where do you want to position yourself within the future of work? You need to evolve your technology skills within your organization. You need to take ownership of your community. When we understand we've positioned, we've evolved, we've taken ownership, now we need to do is promote that. So you've got a great little video of Mike. Take that and share it. This one's probably the most important. You have to love what you do. I'm fortunate enough to travel all around the world, work with some incredible people, and it never ceases to amaze me how at the end of a, a talk, a training session, whatever that might be, Somebody, and I, I did share this with uh, Kimberly and Caroline last night, came into tears because they realized how much they didn't love what they were doing. Because if you don't love what you're doing, how can you truly be that fire starter? How can you be that person that's going to really embrace this future of work? And the final part here is all about engagement. We need to build two-way conversations with people and talk to them about where we're going within the company and what we're doing as individuals. So position yourself, evolve your technology skills, take ownership of your community, promote, 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 love what you do, and engage with your audience. Now, to help you do this, I've put together a bit of a personal framework for you. So inside of each and every one of your uh, CFO conference uh, flyers here, you'll notice that there is a little personal framework here, which I wanted to share and to give to everybody today. If you'd like to take this out, please, you could do one of two things. You can either um, write down next to it here, write on the reverse, grab your phone where you wrote down the five self-reflecting questions earlier that we spoke about. But what I want you to do, and this is all about you and what's important to where you want to grow within the organization. The first one, personal ambition. What's your mission in business? What is it that you want to achieve? I heard from Kimberly exactly what her mission is last night by working with RTI. What's your mission? What is your vision to help others? Sorry to keep picking on you, Kimberly, but it seems quite relevant. One of uh, Kimberly's uh, visions to help others is not so much about her, but she shared with me how she has that vision for her children. If somebody falls over in the street, she wants her child to be the first person that goes over there and helps that person. Are you that person in the organization? If somebody's struggling to do something, somebody turns up late because of something personal that's going on at home, whatever that might be, are you that person that helps them? So this is your personal ambition. Please take a minute or two to write what your personal ambition is down. What is your mission in business? What is your vision to help others? So please take a minute to think about this. You can go back to your five self-reflecting questions that might help you answer this. What is your personal ambition? Take a moment, please, to write this down. What's your mission? And what's your vision to help others? Good to see some people using pen and paper. Fantastic. This might be the start of a journey for you. I don't expect you to have all of the answers immediately, but it is something that I want you to be thinking about. So step number two of the framework, who are you? What are your skills? What are you skillful at? What is your style? What is Mike's style? What is Kimberly's style? What is Caroline's style? What is your style? How do you like to work? How do you like to work with other people? What have you achieved? MBAs, accreditations. 
The beautiful thing about online learning these days, you can get a certificate to be a digital leader. You can get a certificate to be a machine learning expert. Get a certificate built on blockchain. So who are you? What's your style? What are your skills? What are your accreditations? Now, typically in the UK especially, we're not very uh, good at talking about all the things that we've achieved. So if I asked you all to go and take a look at your LinkedIn profiles and scroll down to the bottom and look at your accreditations of what you've achieved, are they on there? Because if not, why not? You spent a lot of time, effort, energy, potentially money achieving that outcome. You should feel good about telling people. Step number three, what do you want to achieve? What do you want to achieve at work? What do you want to achieve within the industry that you're in at the moment? Um, again, when I was over in Oman, one of the guys that work in the, the Muscat Bank, that's something that he wanted to do. He wanted to put a trademark around who he is within the banking sector. So he spent eight months putting together a white paper to decide whether or not blockchain was right for the banking industry in Oman. Eight months. Work gave him time off to achieve it. He spent a lot of his own personal time, which then had a knock on effect in his personal life. <laughs> However, it was something that he wanted to achieve. He wanted to put his mark on the industry and say, yep, this is, I am Ahmed, and I'm the guy that put the white paper together that helped all of the banks not waste thousands and thousands and millions potentially of dollars because the market's not ready for blockchain yet. So he was just finishing that off when I was with him, and then he sent me a really nice message to say that, um, that the local bank had given him uh, the go-ahead for the governance to be able to release this white paper. So that's what he did. He wrote a white paper based on what he wanted to achieve for him at work, but more importantly, within his industry. So if you want to achieve something, the next stage is how will you do that? Will you set up an internal podcast? Have you, got, do you, have you got an internal podcast at the moment within the organization? Have you got another one? No? Okay. So who wants to be the fire starter that starts up the podcast, that interviews all the different subject matter experts, the individuals that come in and talk about AI or RPA, whatever that might be? Who's that person that's going to start that? You want to achieve? You want to give, you want to put a stamp on things? I'm going to set up a podcast. The next one, creating your own community. So who are those influencers within the whole organization at the moment that you can bring in and embrace to achieve this outcome that you want? What you want to achieve? How will you do it? Who are those people around you that can help you achieve this outcome? Build your own community. I believe you guys are using um, Yammer and Teams at the moment. So if you're using Teams, set that up, set a beautiful little group up and invite those influencers in and share with them your vision of what you want to achieve within the company and within the industry. So who are those influencers? Number five, how will you get your voice heard? Will you ask people to come in at eight o'clock in the morning and do a little presentation to them? We use podcasting as a way to let everybody know exactly what it is that you're going to be doing. How are you going to get your voice heard? You're the fire starter. You're the one that sees this vision and believes in this vision. Conversations, sharing. Number seven, listening, monitoring. I've got a great little tool that I use that allows me to listen in to different industries, different experts, different thought leaders in real time. That particular piece of software is called Feedly, F-E-E-D-L-Y. Feedly.com allows me to listen in and monitor anything that's happening in any industry in real time. So I can go to the app on my phone and find out exactly what the latest information is around artificial intelligence from Berkeley University. Because I've asked it to listen to that information, it gives it to me in real time. How are you going to listen and monitor that industry news and company news? I saw you've got uh, TV screens out there showing that company news. And the very last stage, entrepreneurship. Are you ready to be a fire starter? Are you ready to go through and help the company go through a digital transformation? 
Is that you building that entrepreneurship within the organization? So these are the eight step process. Again, you might want to take this away. You might want to spend more time on it after today. What's your ambition? Who truly are you? What do you want to achieve? How will you do this? Who can you help bring along that journey with you with those influences? How are we going to talk to, how are we going to amplify what it is that we're doing? How can we make sure that what we're doing, we're listening to what's really happening within our industry? And are you ready to be that fire starter and go through that transformation? So to finish up with you, I just want to bring you back to uh, the future of work um, eight theme process here, starting on the mission, which we touched on, then looking at the people, the place of the environment, and then the technology that we're going to be using. So my name's Warren Knight. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Sorry about the jet lag kicking in a little bit. And uh, I hope uh, it's been fantastic uh, being with you guys today. And thank you very much.